Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, gentlemen, for being here. It's always educational, but I got to tell you, for the viewers at home and, and for the public, what you say is very hard, number one, to understand, and number two, it's very hard for them to accept. There's not a town hall meeting I don't go to where somebody says, you ought to be out of this mess, you should have been out of it before, you ought to just bite the bullet and you ought to take it. You know, I'll take the hit right now. What would you, the two of you say if that constituency were sitting right here in plain language, what would you say to them would be the cost to the taxpayer to take that bullet right now and just end this plan and, and pay for it? Do you have any, any numbers on that? And, and the plan? End the plan, pay the unfunded liability, and move into a defined contribution plan. In excess of $40 billion, but I'll leave it to the uh, CIOs. <clears throat> you got the number. I don't know. You know, our unfunded liability is $15 billion. So you, you make up that unfunded liability. Um, you, you essentially have all, all, all your annuitants fully paid for, and then you could close the plan. Mm -hmm. And theirs is twice the size of ours. Right, and ours would be about right 26.5 billion. But again, if you close the plan at this point, uh, there, there potentially could be that litigation of that contract impairment issue. So you're looking between the two systems. Yours is what, again, about 15. 15. You know, so it's going to be 30, 31, 41 billion dollars. Yeah. Well, 45. Okay. And, and I understand these are, you're looking at me like, I can't believe you're asking these questions, but these are the questions we get, and these are the questions that need to be answered directly and, and squarely with our constituency so they understand the choices that we all have to make in these rooms. Uh, what would you say to them if they said, which is something I frequently get, why don't you just bank, file for bankruptcy? Well, I believe that the short answer to that question is states are not allowed to file for bankruptcy. Okay. That's our understanding as well. Um, my, would be mine as well, and, and I, I can think of all the other repercussions that would be involved, even if you were. Uh, but it would be significant to the state. Nonetheless, it's, it's a question that gets asked and needs a straightforward answer, and I appreciate that. The last question I would ask you is really one that that I have more than than even my constituency, having sat through a number of these very informative, sometimes painful discussions of uh, what reality is. It seems to me that um, you've answered the question very adequately with the previous um, uh, testif testimony about why we don't just convert the entire plan. Um, it also is suggestive to me, though, that you have thought about whether there should be a hybrid plan and at what point. The question for both boards would be, have you identified through your experts at what point that rate of contribution uh, would be in the future, the projected rates, where it would make sense to move to a hybrid plan? Is that something that can be calculated so that you say it's year 2014, 2015, whatever it is, that you would be able to say to us, it now makes sense both in a short term or a long term? And maybe the answer is you, you see no point where that makes any sense. Uh, I, I think when we were looking at that, and again, uh, Representative Grail was uh, responsible for having a hybrid plan introduced in the House, and I think it was Senator Yaw in the Senate, a very similar type of plan. Uh, when Free Act 120, basically a series of options were on the table for benefit reductions. Hybrid plan was one of those, uh, those plans. Uh, obviously, the, the General Assembly chose not to do that, but went the 120 route. So at this point, if you were to go to hybrid plan, the savings that you would have would be fairly, very small. Uh, and we, you know, I can probably find a projection that sort of compares the two uh, based on some outdated data. But if you introduce a hybrid plan now, it's only going to shave basis points off this unfunded liability on a going forward basis. Because again, the, the vast majority of the savings has already been made under 120. That's why that employer, uh, uh, employer normal cost has been reduced to 3%. So the net effect is if you went to a hybrid, now we would have three tiers of benefits to administer and you have very little savings going forward. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that, uh, obviously if the plan sponsor has a choice of how to provide for a pension for their employees. We're prepared to work and have worked with members of the General Assembly on a variety of different alternative design features, hybrid plan, uh, defined contribution plan, uh, cash balance plans. There have been a number of, of opportunities for us to have dialogue, and we're prepared to do that again. 
what you have to bear in mind in all of these is that each time you are switching a new, to a new tier of benefits, you can't take care of the unfunded liability without satisfying it. I understand. Uh, final uh, question, if I might, and I, I don't want to take up other members' times. How would you, e each of your boards, respond to the criticism that uh, the legislature and governor came under when we made our last uh, collars and the like uh, about just kicking the can down the road. I mean, that was a frequent comment. Even the newspaper editorials picked that up. What would your response be to that, that comment? Do you think we were responsible or do you think we really literally just kicked the can down the lane for, or down the road for a later date? Well, I think the law you passed at the end of 2010 was a big step forward. That wasn't kicking the can down the road. Or if it was, it was just a little bit. Um, uh, the, the other side of it is, if you look at how this was structured, obviously it was trying to balance what was fiscally prudent from the Commonwealth's perspective and also the district's perspective to fund, and then also how to basically get this unfunded liability paid off in a reasonable manner. If you look at the total, uh, the total uh, package here, what happened, there's actually a savings to the taxpayers over this time frame. So yes, there's things that have been deferred, but the benefit cuts have actually outweighed the, the cost of the deferral taking place. So on our, our side, it's about a $1.38 billion savings over this time period, about a 30-year time period, and there'd be some equivalent savings on the service side. So it depends how you define kicking the can down the road. In this case, we actually kicked it, but we're saving money. Yeah, um, Act 120 saves $1.5 billion in the service plan alone over the 30 years. And I thank you for your candor and your answers today to all the uh, representatives. I know we're, we're in this together and we're trying to work through it. Just a quick comment, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I think if all we had to deal with was this one issue and we didn't have to provide for education and welfare services and all the other things we need to do, we might be able to really tackle this uh, in short order. But given those competing needs, I guess we're doing, uh, in my opinion, right now the best we can do. And I thank you for your expertise.